Kachan is monitoring the uh, chat session for the, uh, the audience that's watching the live stream. And there's a, let's start with a question from the chat. Yes, the, I, I think we can... Um, uh, 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 hi, Anthony. Hello, sir. How are you? <laughs> good, good to see you again. Doing good. Um, there was a question during the uh, afternoon lunch break when you were taking your nap and um, th there was some discussion about how honest is street epistemology. Uh, is it sort of manipulative? Are you really thinking that you know all the answers and you just talk people into uh, uh, taking over your belief or, or is it an honest, non-manipulative conversation? Can, can, you, can you reflect on that? Sure. This is actually a fairly common question. I think, I think I touched on it a little bit, but I'll expand on it. Uh, when you encounter somebody who perhaps you disagree with, and then you realize, oh, this is this great tool where I can challenge somebody about their views and maybe get them to change your mind. I could definitely understand how it could be seen that way. Uh, although if you are a person who wants to believe true things and you hold views, uh, most people do like to be challenged. So, uh, if your view is, if you do think that your view is true, I think that you should be open to it. But uh, my advice really is if you are wanting to practice this or attempt to use it, is to reveal what your goals are. If you recall, we talked about that, that step zero, where you're, you're having a conversation with yourself almost before you even use this tool. What am I hoping to achieve with this person? What would I consider a success? And if your view, if your goal is to change a person's mind or, or convert them or deconvert them or something along those lines, I would say that you probably do have an obligation to let your conversation partner know, give them a heads up. Do you have to do it? No. Should you do it? Perhaps. My barometer, the thing that I use if I'm ever in doubt, is I'll ask my conversation partner, uh, would you be okay if I asked you questions that could challenge this view? What would your life be like if you suddenly realized that this wasn't true? How big of an impact are we talking about? So for safer topics like karma, maybe you don't want to go to that level. But if it's a topic about vaccines, maybe it might be a good one where it could actually signal to other people in your tribe, maybe that you're not a part of that tribe anymore if you were to change your mind on it. Uh, there are some consequences of these questions. So I usually ask my conversation partner if they think I should proceed. Interestingly, a lot of people will say, yes, go ahead. But I think that they're saying that because they're so sure that they're right. Their view is unassailable. And in many cases, I think people don't consider the question that you've asked because they don't think it's possible. But in my experience, it is possible with this approach. You can really make a lot of inroads. So if I get the sense that they didn't really weigh my Weigh, weigh the import of my question accordingly, I might just repeat the question and say, just so you know, I'm pretty good at asking these types of questions and I don't want to harm you. Are you still okay if I proceed? And if they give you the thumbs up, I would say go for it, but still monitor it. Um, I found that street epistemology works really good in short bursts, five, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes max, and then end the talk so that they can then process what you've talked about and that gives you both time to decide, do I want to continue? If they keep coming back for more, I would say that that's the green light. Okay. Uh, excellent question, by the way. Thanks, uh, Anthony, for your elaborate answer. Uh, question from the audience, the live audience on site, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Hi, Anthony, thanks for your uh, talk. I'm a nutrition scientist and I just got an email. Um, and is there an online epistemology version? Can I do this in email, Twitter? Mm, interesting. A lot of people have attempted to use street epistemology over text-based mediums like email. I've done it over Twitter. I have a video on my channel, it's a tutorial video, where I show how you can use street epistemology. If you go to YouTube and search for my name, you'll probably find that. It's a little dated. It's back when somebody was saying that uh, Obama was a dictator and he would never uh, leave office. That person remembered that conversation, by the way. <laughs> so these conversations do tend to stay with people for a very long time, uh, even if they are text-based. My sense, though, is that email is good for maybe establishing a little bit of rapport and setting out the parameters of your conversation. And if you can, try to meet them in person or do it over video chat. There's so much that's lost in text-based communication that I think is really crucial. 
when you're using SE, you can notice those moments of reflectful thinking, for example, if it was face to face and you wouldn't get that over email. Uh, but sometimes it's not an option for you and that's your only option. And you can absolutely do it over email. I think it's just a little bit more difficult. There's room for, exp uh, for an experiment there then. Indeed. <laughs> We're always for an experiment. Other questions from, yeah, right up front and then over there. I was wondering if you have ever been at like another kind of demonstration, like uh, people who are for the uh, environment. Uh, do you question those people or do you just question the people who, who you dis disagree with? <laughs> That's a great question. So when I first saw, set out to talk to the theists in front of the Alamo in San Antonio, uh, I was looking for theists, but not everybody that I stopped to talk with me was a theist. So what do you do? Well, I started questioning, well, why don't you think God is real? And uh, I, I guess I asked myself, like, if I really think that this is an equal opportunity tool, I should use it on any claim, even ones that I happen to agree with. The interesting thing, though, is when I talk to somebody who has a view similar to mine and or has a view that seems to be backed up very strongly by science, I've noticed it. Hmm, this sounds arrogant almost to say it, but I've noticed it harder to challenge. I think it's harder to challenge somebody that you agree with or somebody that seems to have good data to back up their findings. Supernatural claims are really you can you can zip through them very quickly using SE. Scientific based claims are a little bit more challenging. You can still use the approach. I think the work, here's the solution though to it is to teach people who hold the opposing view this technique, because I think that somebody could uh, do a better job of questioning another person about a view if they disagree with them. Maybe there's more skin in the game for you as the questioner because you disagree with them. So you're more engaged in the conversation. But again, I think this, that's the solution is teach everybody this tool. I want the flat earthers and the theists and the people who think karma is real and all the skeptics that are in the audience to learn this, because I think that will lead in the end to a, a higher quality result overall. Maybe just a, a very brief question because I'm, I'm kind of concerned about uh, Karma Kiana um, that we saw this morning um, in combination with your ethical considerations. So why do we take her happy attitude away? So why do ah. we want her to be confronted with the, the meaningless of life and existential threats that she is now experiencing? Of course, I'm exaggerating, but you, you know what of I mean. Course. So what do we yes, do? So yes. what, what is the, the ethical justification of, of doing this? That's a great question. So I, I think your question is based on the, the, the assumption that she can only find meaning in her life from thinking that karma is real. Ultimately, that decision is up to her. Now, she may have ne ne never even considered that there are other options to get me. Who knows how much meaning in life she gets from karma? Um, I don't know. Maybe there was a tremendous amount of meaning. It's really hard to say. I should point out as a side note, as she was walking away from that conversation right afterwards, she ran into some friends and she hadn't seen them in a very long time. And then she turned back to me and she was so excited and said it was karma because she ran into her <laughs> friends. So it's not like she immediately got rid of her belief. This is usually a gradual process that people will, will work through at their own pace. Another interesting thing is, is I invited her to come back after she said, oh, look, it's karma. And she was hugging her friends. I invited her to come back. And she did about 30 minutes later. And we continued the conversation. So typically, I leave it up to the person that I'm speaking with to decide if they are comfortable with it. And a really good question to ask, if you're ever in doubt, is you can ask somebody, if you one day discovered that this belief wasn't true, or, or at the very least, you decided that you couldn't support it to your own standard, what would be the next best way to deal with hardship or find meaning in life right. or those types of things? Yeah. And that in and of itself, I think, can, can cause that reflection and maybe even belief revision. It's a, it's a very tough call. You know, it really is. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah, Th there's and, one more uh, question from. And, and here's ook wel een paar vragen. Yeah, yeah. First we go to a question yeah. in the audience, and then we go to the chat. Sometimes I think it is more about our problem to communicate with anti-vaxxers than.
to learn anti-vaxxers to uh, to get out of the bubble. So ah, it's nice to 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 learn how to communicate with an anti-vaxxer without getting in trouble with him. Um, but after f 15 minutes, um, uh, you you have uh, the satisfaction. Uh, I didn't get in trouble with the anti-vaxxer, and the anti-vaxxer he he uh, he thinks well. I I, I could explain uh, why I'm uh, anti-vax. One more aspect of that last question might be that once you get into a street epistemologist, uh, a street epistemology session, and you don't succeed, then the effect might be of the one that you want to try to, you know, uh, uh. let him or her think. Um, uh, you, you think you, know, you you give away your victory, so to speak, and the victory is then on the side of the anti-vaxer or. The, the flat oh, earther, and, and they go home, you know, victorious, um, and, mm. and telling their friends, you know, I, I met this uh, street epistemologist, he was a skeptic, but yeah, you know what, I won. So is, is, is that an... It, it is a possibility. That, I suppose that could happen, and it probably does. My sense is that, and I'm probably biased because I'm a proponent of this approach, and I've, I've, I think I've seen firsthand, and, and people have come up to say, those questions resulted in me thinking about my position. Now, sometimes people will return and say, I'm even more resolute in my position than I was before. That can be discouraging as a practitioner of this approach when you hear it. Like, yeah, what are you okay. talking about? All of your reasons were bad reasons, and you basically admitted that they were bad, and yeah, yet you're not allowing it to impact your confidence. Exactly. It could be really helpful to say, well, what other reasons might be holding up this view? It's very likely that there are no reasons whatsoever other than possible psychosocial motivations, uh, psychological reasons. If you have a successful conversation and you have um, uh, 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 that, that resulted in, um, uh, 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 like the two examples we saw, we saw in, in people be, be willing to change their yeah. opinions, and, and their, their, their beliefs. Is there any research on how long the effect will last? I don't know the answer to it, but I can tell you that a lot of people have noticed what we're doing in street epistemology who are in fields of psychology like motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral therapy where studies have been done. So it's possible that there might be some studies out there that actually show that there's something to this. But at the moment, there's nothing specific to just street epistemology or the technique rebuttal. Uh, we've seen a few studies in the past on the backfire effect, this idea that if I give somebody facts that they'll, they'll double down even on their position or at the very least stay at their current position. But if you use a, a different approach that they might uh, be a little bit more open-minded, the results on that are a little bit mixed. It's one of the reasons why we started the nonprofit organization, streetepistemologyinternational.org. And one of the reasons why I'm doing talks like this is to get the word out so that people who are academics, scientists perhaps, can actually study this, maybe put people in MRIs and, and do long-term studies. Uh, what, in some of my videos, I've been going out and, and offering people one of these three pieces of a, of a gear. Uh, these are little uh, stress ball type of thing. So I wanna have multiple conversations with people. And I, I have many videos on my channel where people were coming back and it seemed like uh, they weren't afraid to continue the conversation. They were giving a significant amount of time to think about what we talked about. And I was actually noticing changes over time, sometimes even complete abandonment of beliefs. But this is all anecdotal. This is not science. And I, I understand the liability of saying that in front of a room full of skeptics, but we have to study it. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yes, or yeah. there are lots of questions. Lots of questions. Uh, an, another question good, is, good. Do, do we need a reasonable people to SE with? C can you SE with an unreasonable person? Oh, that's a good question. So if it depends on what you mean by unreasonable. Sometimes unreasonable can just mean closed-minded. They're being dogmatic in their views. Many times there are what I found is that there are some topics that people are more sensitive about than others. A really good approach is to pick safer topics with people. So if I run into somebody who's dogmatic that the earth is flat, I may want to talk about a completely different topic, like the red cars getting speeding tickets or something. You can be basically using the approach on safer topics to essentially teach the person. And you don't have to be sneaky about it either. You can, you can lay this out. Like, 
you seem to be really guarded and closed minded on the whole flat earth thing. Do you want to talk about something else? Like maybe there's a safer topic that we can explore so that I can show you this approach and maybe get you thinking about it and maybe even considering using it on your deeper beliefs. Some people don't have the training or the education. They were never exposed to thinking carefully or critically about their views. And, and that's, a, that's a very hard thing to overcome. You could also run into people who are hostile. I have a couple conversations going on on YouTube where I'm trying to get people to, to meet me on Zoom, but they're very aggressive. And it's, it's nearly impossible to use, a, to use a street epistemology approach with a very hostile person. You have to address it. And one of the best ways, I think, is to be truthful, be genuine, and invite them to get to know you a little bit better. But you have to address the hostility first. It's a difficult thing to decide how long you try, you know, uh, time-wise, how long you try with someone who's close-minded or unreasonable. H how much energy and time do you put in before you... Uh, assess the situation in such a way that you know the person is just close-minded or the person is just unreasonable do you have any experience with that yeah I, I, I'm in an ongoing conversation with a childhood friend's mom she's in her 70s but she's insistent on me exploring her God belief and I took all the precautions I explained what I was doing I warned her of the potential outcomes she's just as resolute in her position even though I think we've demonstrated to her standard that she doesn't have any good reasons for thinking that it's true, but she's still so sure. And now I'm wondering, well, how much of a good, how much of a good use of my time is this? Right. That's one of the questions you have to ask. Another right. question is how many other people can this person affect? If this is, if she was a YouTuber who had a million subscribers, I would, I would probably talk with her for the, the whole year, uh, but she's not. And it's probably a better use of my time to prepare giving talks like this and that type of thing. So right, right, right. Uh, that's a personal decision that you'll have to make. Yeah. So it's all about, you know, what is at stake from your point of view. Right. Yeah. Any more questions from, yeah. One over here. And then Great questions, one. by the way. I'm loving it. <laughs> we do our best. Um, yeah. Um, Mr. Lee McIntyre, earlier this afternoon, he stated that distrust is at the heart of science denial. So, wh wh what's your comment on that? I mean, <clears throat> is uh, street epistemology um, helping to establish more trust in science? I mean, make a kind of uh, thought experience some creationist street epistemologist comes to me and asks, why do you believe in Big Bang? Mm. Wow. The only thing I could say, because I trust science. I have some yes. arguments, but I mean, and that's, I think this holds for a lot of scientific <coughs> views. Normal people, regular people, even if they have good secondary education, they would not be able to articulate the basis of the scientific uh, knowledge uh, in, a, in a, let's say, in a way you ask from the other people. So isn't this question of trust and distrust really the core issue? That's a big challenge today. There's a, a lot of distrust. We saw that in the example with Mary. She was distrustful. I can't believe anything that I see on the internet these days. I think even implying results from established government institutions showing results. It seemed like she put a higher value on personal experience. It might be a wake-up call, like noticing what's happening in the culture with distrust and then seeing these rebuttal techniques uh, coming into fashion, I suppose. I'm wondering if um, there might be some future merging of these two where maybe what needs to happen is that the scientific examples that we present to people need to be more personal I'm wondering if Mary would have found those studies much more convincing if they were limited just to her neighborhood or something along those lines, as opposed to here's what's happening in your state or this country <clears throat> or the country or the world, for example. Uh, maybe we have to personalize it and make it a little bit more uh, understandable and relatable to the person. 
the other thing I wanted to mention is that, yeah, it's very difficult. If, if somebody were to SE me on why I think the earth is round or why the, the COVID vaccine is, is a good idea, I would probably struggle with it and I would probably defer to the scientists. I have trust in science. Here's the distinction, though, is that we tend to see is that trust in science, uh, there, there's a testability component to trust. Uh, in those cases, if I and my conversation partner were dedicated enough, we probably could actually follow the thread back far enough to see the test results that were being out there, maybe talk to the scientists who are conducting the tests. We don't have time to generally do that. However, we don't have the ability to do that in the case of the earth being flat or, uh, or things along those lines, or maybe something taken on faith. So... Uh, it's a real big challenge because we are trusting, we are placing our trust in things, uh, but it's the testing component that I think makes the difference. If we can test it, if we can actually follow the test results, that I think is what usually tips the balance. Uh, Martin, uh, would you uh, consider asking your question uh, if discussions will go any different without a camera? I think that happens to a degree. Uh, maybe people are... Let's face it, maybe they're more dishonest because they're on camera, or maybe they're more honest because they're on camera. Who knows? Uh, but it is a factor that probably has the ability to, to, distort, uh, to distort the results a little bit. I had a situation a couple of times where people would say, on a scale from 1 to 100, what their position was on some claim. And they would say, I'm an 80, or I'm at 100. And then after the conversation, and I turned the camera off, they would come back up to me and say, just so you know, like, I don't even think that that's true, but there's an expectation in my culture to say that it is. So uh, you don't know, I, I really, who, who knows what's happening, but it is a factor, I think. Is it fair to share your own opinions after you've had a conversation like this? Great question. I think it's fair. Yeah, I think that if you don't, Sometimes people don't care. They don't care what your position is. I don't know if Mary cared what Mark's position was, but if she asked him, I think that he should be willing, and, and people who use SE should be willing to share their views. Uh, sharing your views, by the way, on some supernatural claims, if I say, well, I don't think that your God is real, I don't believe in karma or ghosts, or even on the vaccines, could cause defensiveness, but I think that you should share your views. Just keep in mind what the outcome can be if you do it. But if you've established rapport, if you built that relationship with people and you share your views in a very nice way, like, yeah, I, I don't think that that's true. However, I'm still open to it and I'm eager to talk to people who think otherwise because maybe you're right or maybe you're wrong and maybe I can help you discover that you're mistaken on this thing. You can, you can really reveal your position in a way that doesn't close people down, but it's, it takes a little practice. There are two questions uh, from, from the chat that, uh, that are interesting. I, I think one question would be, how important is it really that people uh, understand better how science works? Isn't a lot of the, the problems we are discussing here uh, the, uh, the result from the fact that people are really not aware how science works at all. Hmm. I don't know if I'm the best person to ask that question to. Uh, my sense is that people f appreciate science, no matter where they stand on any claim, they see the value of it. They're carrying around cell phones that were produced from science and they marvel at the, the discoveries of space and that type of thing. So I think, I think people understand the, the value of it. Um, do they understand it? No, I think there's there's a significant, especially in my country, I think there's a significant misunderstanding of science. People think that uh, scientists are declaring the actual truth of the matter. They don't understand that it's a, it's a tentative position that's bolstered by evidence. And there's a willingness to correct our views in science. Uh, that's the common thing that I run into is that um, there's almost a bias against science in some ways that uh, that they see science or these these uh, these conclusions changing so much that people lose trust in science. Uh, they don't understand that that's the natural process of the scientific method. Uh, and that I think it can probably only be addressed with education. Uh, it, interestingly, as we look at this, this rebuttal approach of street epistemology, 
it seems like it's in a way the dialectical version of the scientific method. We're establishing the claim or the hypothesis. We're looking at the supporting reasons. We're assessing how you tested those reasons to see if they're sure. We're in a way kind of packaging the scientific method and delivering it through dialogue. And But what's cool is people respond to it. They love being on the receiving end generally. Now it could be uncomfortable to have a deeply held view challenged and be on the receiving end of that scientific approach packaged as dialectical. But people, I think, understand the value of it. Um, maybe that's one of the ways that we can show people that the scientific method is useful is through this approach. I'm not sure. Right. Other well, questions? Well, there, there, there was one obvious question. I, uh, I uh, waited with that uh, until the last uh, moment, oh, until right. all the other questions were, 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 were gone. Uh, uh, how do we uh, found an SE group in the Netherlands was one question. So I, I thought it would be nice to, to yeah. ask you that at the end. Yeah, there are several clubs that are popping up across the, across the world. Uh, we're developing uh, a package of materials for people to create their own clubs, that type of thing. There's one in Germany. There's another one in Russia. Uh, I think there's one in France. There's one in Oregon of all places. So um, people are creating these groups, but there's no... Basically, two or three people could probably gather who see the value of this approach and can start it. Um, because of COVID, it's kind of curtailed our outreach activities of going around and, and spreading the word of this approach. We've been largely doing it online. Honestly, I think the best thing is probably to go to some of the online communities first. If you go to streetepistemology.com, I see that the, that the slide is showing there. Yep. And click on communities and also resources. Uh, communities is probably a good place to go first. We have a very active Discord server where people are meeting on a weekly basis to learn the approach, to share their experiences, and to practice it. You can actually have a conversation with somebody about a deeply held belief about the environment or vaccines or religion or whatever, and have somebody use the approach. And then afterwards, they dissect the conversation. Other people from around the world will then give you feedback. Uh, so the online communities are a really good resource. And, but there are a few people that like to meet in person and do that. Anthony, we, um, we very much appreciated uh, your night shift uh, from, uh, from America. Uh, we're so glad that you uh, found the energy and the time to do this with us and to, um, to talk us through you know, the first principles and then the more substantial principles of, of street epistemology and learn and talk to people because it's better for them and better for us. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you.